This is the Power Producers Podcast, where we are refining and redefining the sales game. Rule number one is you have to believe in yourself. You're the only one who doesn't think you belong in this appointment. The prospect has already validated your existence by scheduling time with you. Get it through your head you belong here, go in there, crush it, and close the deal. A place where sales professionals can come to learn from other sales professionals and thought leaders that have mastered their craft. The difference between a good salesperson and a best-in-class salesperson is only two minutes. By spending an extra two minutes on what you might think is a mundane task in the sales game, you separate yourselves from the pack, you grow your book of business, you close more deals, and you retain your accounts. As well as their peers who are still striving for perfection to achieve their why. I have a wife and four kids. Failure is not an option. Real sales professionals. Real stories. Real results. Are you ready to feel the power? What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Power Producers Podcast, where we are refining and redefining the sales game. And today we have the one, the only Nick Berry from Tech Marketer. And we're going to talk about marketing, something every single one of us has thought about as we head into the new year, whether it be looking at budgets or looking at new tools to try out processes. There's people everywhere telling you what you should do, but how many of you are taking action on any of it? I don't know. That's a question you have to answer yourself when you look in the mirror, but we're going to give you some stuff today. We're going to give you a real, real good episode of things that you can do to go out and get yourself noticed, if nothing else. So before we get ramped up too much, Nick, why don't you do uh, everybody the service to tell them who you are, where you came from, how you got there, just in case they don't know you. Yeah. Um, so my name is Nick Berry. I have been in the insure tech, broker tech space um, since 2015. So a few years, um, basically since the kind of broker tech, insure tech blew up. Um, prior to that, I spent most of my career in sales. Um, and that's where I learned marketing. Um, so for the last eight years or so, I've been going learning marketing from the experiences I had in sales and then applying it to and helping SaaS companies. Um, but during that time, I, I really, I, our customers are insurance agents, right? And so I was looking at and watching what insurance agents are doing. And I'm like, <laughs> okay. Sorry. <laughs> I, I see. But the, the, the thing is, I see the good with the bad. Or the non-existent. Or the That's non-existent. really why I was laughing. I want to be clear to anybody listening to this. If you hear me laugh like that, I'm never laughing at the person who puts out a video that doesn't look good. That person's trying. They're mm-hmm. trying to do something. And, and, and what I've learned, and, and here's the thing, stuff on the internet doesn't go go to a graveyard. It stays on the internet. And so if you look hard enough, you're going to find mine from 20 years ago. And when you see them, you'll probably laugh just like I did. But at the end of the day, man, I don't. I, I laugh because... For as many agencies as are out there, it's just crazy to me how few have a solid online presence today. I mean, that's your resume, man. It's your resume. It's it, it's your your posting on Indeed before they ever go to Indeed to figure out who you are, or for your clients to determine whether or not you're a company they want to do business with. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I I did an experiment this summer. My wife and I bought our first house together this summer. And so I wanted to do an experience. I have a great insurance agent. I love him. He's one of my best friends. Um, but I was still like, I had to do my due diligence. And, and I wanted to see, like, I've always been on the outside, like as working in the insure techs. And I was sure. like, I want to see what the experience really is like with a consumer. Like I, I, all I had to do is call Patrick and say, Hey, listen, we're buying a house. Here's the address. Give me what I need right? Here's our cars. Um, give me what I need. But I wanted to have that experience. I tested four local agencies here in the, here in the town I live in, in rural Iowa. Of the four, I had to call, like I had to fill, I filled out their form because that's the experience everybody, every agent says they want to have, right? They want to have a digital experience for their consumers. I filled out the quote forms. Three of them were contact forms. So they didn't like, it was just like, Hey, what's your name? And why are you contacting us? Yeah, we'll call you back, maybe. Yeah, yeah. None of them responded. I take that back. One did respond six days later. I had to call all of them 
to start it. Two didn't even get me a quote. One was just like, they didn't even try. Like, I know the market and I'm like, that's not even, you didn't even try it with any other carriers. You just went with your incumbent carrier. And the other, the one that did get me, get back to me, it was just such a pain. I was like, man, is the, if this is the experience that consumers are getting, this is, we need to fix it. Um, so, and the whole reason I started Tech Marketer, the original reason I started it is not even to do client services for agencies. I wanted to teach the marketing tactics and strategies because I know, I'll, I'll, like, A, I want insurance agencies to have the information they need to make good informed decisions. Just like we say, what agencies say to their consumers, to their customers. Right. Yeah. I wanted them to be able to make good informed decisions because everybody, and I know this is a fact, every agency owner gets hit up by marketing agencies multiple times a month. And it doesn't matter if it's SEO, if it's content marketing, if it's advertising, all they get hit up. And I see so many of them make uninformed decisions because they get sold on something without knowing the full background. So the whole reason I started my newsletter January of 2023 was that. Then I got into it and I was having a conversation with a couple mentors and they're like, Nick, who would you send it? it you're doing this, who would you send people to? And I was like, there's nobody I would send. Like, there's no marketing agency I would send that knows insurance good enough to be able to right. do this work. And they're like, you know what you have to do. I'm like, I don't want to, but that's <laughs> where we are. Um, yeah, but I mean, I think it is, I think it's needed. Um, we're in a we're in a kind of a weird spot, to be honest with you. Like mm -hmm. a lot of people don't know what they can and cannot trust. Mm -hmm. because it is so easy to get a presence online and it's mm -hmm. easy for you to make it look really, really well produced for not a lot of money either. And so I think yeah. that specific to the insurance industry, cause I can't obviously speak about other industries uh, cause I don't, I'm, I'm not in them at this point, but I just, I feel like there's so many people out there that um, have courses or, you know, learn how to do it the way I did it or whatever else. And I mean, look, I also can be lumped into that probably from an outsider looking in, but what we've built with killing commercial is so radically different. It's not like, it looks like a course on the surface because re in reality, that's the only way you can market it to get people to understand that that's a component of it. When the reality of what we've done is build an extremely powerful community. Um, you know, we've got our own social network where we can operate and, you know, ask questions uh, without worrying about competition because I give geographic exclusivity for people who are in the, in the community. So I won't work with two agencies that are within an hour of each other because I want them to not be tripping over each other on the streets using the same marketing tactics, same materials, same, you know, yeah. pitches and all of that. But you know, there's a lot of power there. And that's the, that's the, the thing that really is kind of the secret sauce that's differentiated everything. Yeah. There's a learning management component to it, but at the end of the day, having that community, having the ability to have some one-on-one -on -one training, if you need it, and then just all of the resource library information and things like that, that we give, but you can't, it, it's really difficult to get people to see that. So it, it's going to be interesting to see what my 2024 looks like specifically because anything and everything that I've been able to do from a marketing standpoint, specific to the non-agency related stuff, the non-Florida risk stuff, has all just kind of been an accident. Like it's all kind of been, oh, it makes sense to do it this way. Let's try it. And then if it doesn't work, you cut bait and you try something else. And I tell you this because... I um I read Russell Brunson's most recent book, Lynchpin. Yes. And I had never I had never read any of the click funnel stuff, mm -hmm. none of the dot com secrets or any of that. And I read it and I'm like, oh my goodness. Like I'm not that far off from what this guy's got. I don't have it packaged the same way, but if you look at I'm like one most incredible free gift ever away from having everything and being able to put a funnel around power producers, mastermind, killing commercial apex, apex predator mastermind. And then now in Shurkan Tampa in 2025, 
but it's interesting to go and study marketers. And I've got a pocket, I've got I've got a pocket of marketers that are digital marketers, very niche focused, very, very specific to what they do. But um I ensure them. They're clients of mine. So I listen to these guys when I'm talking to them about their renewal and we'll talk about different things. And I mean, look, I've got a degree in marketing. I'm not an I'm not a complete idiot, but I'm not formally I haven't gone to like seminars and all of this other stuff. I've just kind of trial and error along the way. So I mean, I'm at a point right now where I've I've read I've read through Lynchpin. I'm wrapping up 100 million offers by Hermosi. I'm going to read his next one. And then I'm going to go back and read Russell Brunson's trilogy. And then when I get done with all of that stuff, hopefully sometime next week, I'm going to be able to sit down and start mapping all this stuff out. But what's evident to me and what I was thinking about as I was reading this and where I think a lot of people mess up is they just don't even have the roadmap or the pl- not even the roadmap, but the plan. Mm-hmm. Like, what do I want to do? What's my mission? What's my goal? Who do I want to reach? What's the message I want them to hear? And then ma- map that out from there. We're not even at the most basic steps. So I'm interested, you know, as somebody who's accidentally had some level of success, what are the things that when you're working with an agency or you go in and work with a new client, what are the things that you're seeing over and over and over again that are not in place that really could be relatively easily that makes your life easier. Because if I'm going to hire a guy like you, I want you to come in and do heavy lifting in my organization, right? Yeah. I want you like a fractional CMO. I want you thinking high level strategy. Let's figure out how to do this. I don't need you constructing my emails. I don't need you, you know, helping me edit video and things like that. I want your 20 years of experience or, or whatever that number is in marketing And I want to use that to my advantage and I want you to show me those things, but there's got to be things agencies could be doing right now to help themselves so that when they get to the point, they need to to go up and level up that your life is easier and they've got some incremental forward progress that they've already made. It's every single agency I've worked with so far. It's the foundational basics that need to be put in place before (laughs) anything else period we got everything that you can find in a vendor hall at a conference though collected dust in the agency but we're not even doing the basics and that's i see it on literally every aspect of agency operations for the most part so what are some examples um a getting every lead into your crm period um making sure you have good operational processes of what happens and what I call an SLA or service level agreement between each part of the organization. Marketing provides the leads. What is sales going to do with those leads and what timeline? And and ta- during that, how much can you automate? Period. Take, and this is, and this is, I don't want anybody to take this the wrong way. I have, I'm a salesperson before I was ever a marketer. I'm still a salesperson. I'm a salesperson again, like back doing this. I'm like, oh, I have to sell again. Hmm. Automate as much as you can for your sales team on the front end. Take as much off of their plate as you possibly can to the point of the relationship starting. That's one of the key things I see every sales organization failing is saying, okay, this is the manual things you're going to do. Well, automate the emails. You know, you got a lead come in, automate an email, send an email from them, from the salesperson saying what the expectations are going to be. Send more emails because the more emails you send to somebody before you have a meeting, the more likely they are to show up to the call or be prepared for you if you're doing in-person meetings. You know, it's funny because we went through this with COVID specifically. Um, you know, I use virtual assistants to mm-hmm. as appointment setters. So mm-hmm. they're completely immune to emotion. <laughs> I mean, they're just going to dial, <laughs> dial, yep. dial. And it's not a complicated script. It's real simple. We know your renewal's coming up and people like me are probably bugging you. We just would like a seat at the table this year. Which day is better for you next week, Wednesday or Thursday? Something along those lines, right? I completely mm-hmm. made that up on the fly, but it, it, it's really... Yeah something that basic and they just get the reps in over and over and over again. And, you know, it, it's interesting to me to think about um, where we would be if we didn't have the leads in the CRM and be able to track that process and know everything that's, that's going on, you know, mm-hmm. in, in their world, because they're part of what we do. So it's um, yeah, keep going. Yeah. 
Now, there's there's a you know all this like you could go read. I've read every marketing book that exists. I try to keep everything simple. You have three buckets of where people are. They've discovered the company. You've identified the problem you have. Their leads. So you follow up with them until they tell you to leave them the heck alone, right? So they're top of funnel. Middle funnel, you had a conversation with them. You're ready to move forward. Third, third bucket is bottom of funnel. You've had the conversation. You've presented your quote. You've done all the work you can. Now it's it's doing getting them through each stage and communicating, finding ways to communicate with them and stay in front of them until they tell you to F off. That's it. That's my, that's my marketing funnels. Well, you know, it's funny. Mine's not, not altogether different than yours. And I remembered what I was starting to say when I spaced out and talked about the VA setting appointments when COVID hit, um, we started doing that and we would set our first appointments based on a zoom meeting because we couldn't go meet with people in person. And mm -hmm. we had some level of success with it. And then COVID kind of has done its thing and has for all practical purposes, it doesn't run our lives anymore like it did. Mm -hmm. And we kept that process. We kept the first meeting on zoom. And so what I noticed was about half the time we were getting porched. People weren't showing up for the meeting. And I'm like, wait a minute, this doesn't happen. Like when I have a meeting with somebody in person, what are we doing differently? And it goes back to what you said. All I really had to do is go to, um, go to HubSpot and have it set up and set the trigger to where now we remind them the day before the morning of and an hour before, and we've not missed anybody yet, you know, mm -hmm. since we started doing that. I think it's interesting though. I'm interested. I, I want to hear what your thought process is. I'm somebody who gets just hammered, man, I hammered <laughs> with inbound emails. It's mm -hmm. absolutely like insane. And, you know, part of me, there's, there's times where I'll get them and I'll read them and I'll be like, that's pretty creative, but I don't even want to reply back and give them props on it because it's just going to never end. And then there's other ones that are absolutely terrible. The one that I hate the most right now, more than any other is when somebody sends an email it could be about virtual professionals. It could be about getting more clients, whatever else. And they'll send you the email and it's, you know, somewhat creatively constructed, but they always look the same. Like if I just looked at it and didn't read it, they all look the same in terms of their structure. And not even two minutes later, I get a second email from I'm the supervisor of such and such. I mean, it's so, so cringeworthy, man. It's insane. And I would never do business with those, those, those companies just because I'm turned off by how their email marketing works. I don't think anybody understands that. There's a, there's an, you have an, it, something you brought up. There was an FTC action last year on somebody for doing that. Well, Pretend and here's the thing, man. And, and, and I've even, so let you you're taking me down the rabbit <laughs> hole now. So I'm going to, I'm going to open the kimono a little bit, but there's been more than one time that I reply back to those people and say, look, I've asked you multiple times not to email me. You do not have any way for me to unsubscribe oh, yeah. in the body of your email message. The only way I know to do it is to ask you. So I'm asking you one more time. And if I hear from you again, I'm going to go to the attorney general for Florida and file a formal complaint against your company because I don't know any other way to make this go away. Yeah, that's that, that, that's literally against the law now. Um, that, so that's it, but, um, I, and I, I have mixed feelings about outbound email, about out, 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 old outreach. There's a way to do it right. And there's a way to do it wrong. 95% of companies are doing it wrong. A, they're literally going and signing up for Lem list and they're just using their templates without any marketing knowledge, without any sales knowledge. They're just be like, Oh, somebody said I can make money sending cold emails. Um, I, if an if company wants to do cold email, I do have a, 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 a very simple tactic. You send them emails, you send them valuable emails. Um, if they ask to stop or they click on subscribe, you remove them from all your lists and you call them. Emails and calls should be tied together, period. You send an email, you should send a call within a 24 hours. That's, it works because you're going to get, especially depending... I would never do, I, 
you can do cold outreach to consumers based on stuff, but it's, it's tricky and it's hard. Um, B2B, I see way more success with cold outreach, but yeah, don't, don't do the, the, my least favorite is, did you get my last email? Yeah. Oh, I, I see that. And I instantly just bumping this up to the top of your inbox. Yeah. You know, I, there's only one time to do that. And that's if you're waiting on a contract to be signed or a payment to come through, that's the only time bumping up inbox should happen. <laughs> right. Yeah. But I get those every day too. Yeah. You know, the other one, the other one that bothers me and, and I have not been as disciplined as I need to for, on the killing commercial side. I used to do a weekly newsletter that I would send out, but I was doing it all myself, man. And it, it's a lot of work when you're going to set something up, try and do it the right way. But it was basically a recap of all the stuff that I put out over the course of the week. I always tried to have at least a blog post. I tried to recap the different podcast episodes. If I did something good on, on a, a video somewhere, I might link back to that or whatever else. But I, I, stopped doing it one week and that turned into two weeks. And now it's probably been, honestly, it's probably been about a year since I've sent anything out, but I only did it once a week. Now, if I'm doing like a boot camp that's coming up and people are registering to be part of that or whatever else. Yeah. I'm going to hype that up to try and drive registration. You may go, you may get two or three emails the week before that boot camp comes but that's all you're going to get from me. What blows my mind is, you know, this is actually, I'm going to, cover two things at once i noticed on tiktok that if i wear a tacky golf shirt i'm gonna get far more reach on my on my videos so i started buying golf shirts from this place called obnoxious golf and it is exactly what you think it would (laughs) i'm so pumped because i had three get delivered today and the 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 one like the whole front of the shirt is nothing but a peacock with its plume spread like the whole thing uh, the other one's all dollar bills, and the other one is like a hurricane on the front, which I'll, I'll do that in, in hurricane season. But it was funny to me because the first time I ever wore, like I've got one that's like a Dia de Muertos shirt that's got sugar skulls on it, and that one's actually pretty cool. It, it is kind of tacky, but it's not from the same company. Every time I wear it, doesn't matter. I always have people comment on that shirt. Where I'm going with this is I might get like five or six emails a day from some of these e-commerce places. It blows my mind how much they send out and they're actually getting away with it. And I don't know how it's continuously coming into my inbox and not getting bounced for spam just based on the volume that's coming in. It, It just, it's insane. They're playing by the rules and there's some basic rules for email. They're, have a your SPF your and there these are all technical things but your SPF your DKM your DMARC and your your DNS all the DNS settings if you have all of those set right and you're not getting a, and you're not getting a lot of spam reports your emails will be delivered most businesses fail at setting those up I did an audit early uh, begin at middle of December of twenty five agencies one agent three agency that's that. Three agencies had all four things set correctly. Hmm. So most businesses, when they're trying to send these emails, like if, if an e-commerce company, they go, they have specialists, they pay a lot of money to, to make sure and manage their deliverability. And that's how those are getting in the inbox. And that's the key, like, that's, those are the things I'm trying to teach agents is like, Hey, well, I was going to say, man, because I don't do any of that myself, but mm-hmm. I know enough to know that's supposed to be done. And I'm mm-hmm. told that that is being done mm-hmm. by the, it, 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 I honestly think it's a combination of the gentleman that handles all of my HubSpot stuff, who also does some of the back end of website, but also mm-hmm. my managed services provider who manages my email as well. Mm-hmm. But we're constantly looking at deliverability constantly. Mm-hmm. And, and I mean, to your point, first part's getting started. The second part is actually measuring what you're doing and then making course corrections or whatever along the way. Yep. Yeah, no, absolutely. The, um, I started this whole newsletter a year ago. I started, I literally had two subscribers. And I just did things and I've been testing and experimenting with different ideas and different applying the tactics and strategies I'm teaching to what I'm doing. And it's, it works. It's amazing how easy it is to get people to buy into your thought processes when you're actually executing on what you're teaching too. Yeah. Yeah. Like that to me, that's the social proof 
more than anything else when in killing commercial one of the benefits if there's such a thing and i don't i don't mean that there's ever a benefit associated with covid but i mean you you find you find opportunity in in adversity and we did and so one of the things that we realized you know with um shoot i'd spaced again man i'm losing my mind today i need to drink more water the what were we talking about prior the we just were going into being that. Co consistency and, and executing on on that oh that yeah, yeah 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 and so you know it gave us a chance to slow down and, and really look at a lot of the things that we're doing mm -hmm. on a weekly basis right and i think that's that's just it's tough, man. It's we got so many things we're doing with running an agency, trying to sell insurance, trying to keep people happy, try to keep clients in in your business, but you got to go get more. You got to market. Everything's shifting, not everything, but a good bit of it's shifting toward content. Who's going to create that? Where's that mm -hmm. come from? And you know, I'm at a point right now, man, where I feel like everything I do is recorded or being used for something that has to do with business. You know, I've got I have a mount that sits right here that I'm recording in cinematic on my iPhone oh, while nice. I'm talking to you here. I recorded our sales meeting when I did um, last week when I did um, the or two weeks ago when I did our boot camp. I recorded in five different video angles so that I could get different content, but it was all the same hour. I'm just getting more out of my hours now. And where where I was headed with that is you know, during COVID, we had the opportunity to do so much on Zoom that we didn't have before. So now when when we're going in and you're you're watching and you're listening and all of that, um, I can record all of my new business appointments and I can post those inside the community and killing commercial so that my members of the community who hear me on the podcast, they hear me on our calls, they you know read blog posts or whatever else. Now they're actually watching me interact with a real prospect in real life. I don't know that that ever would have happened had we not had the pandemic. And the other thing that I've I've used seen Bennett that has benefited us from it by having those recordings is bringing your service team in during sales meeting and, and playing the new business calls of producers and letting your account managers and CSRs throw their two cents in because they don't really get to see that all the time. Now they get to see what the point of sale looks like. And if they're as good as the ones that I've worked with over the course of my career, they're going to show up with a legal pad and a pen and fill it up with a bunch of stuff that I missed in the call. But Absolutely. at least I don't have to I don't have to deal with people who question whether or not I practice what I preach because I'm I'm literally showing right. it to them. Yeah. Um I saw your video last week about you know using Otter and ChatGPT yeah. to doc. I sent that to two dozen people. I'm like, go copy this. Just go do this. You don't even need me right now. Go copy that. Yeah, I <laughs> go mean copy that. It's it's really Probably one of the best guys I've seen do this is is um Bradley Flowers. Oh, uh he everywhere. Everywhere yes. dude's got, you know, and, and yep. he at one point he had a whole entourage of people filming him everywhere he went. And I was in some of those videos because I happened to be be yep. where he was. But I, I look at it now and it's like, you know, one of the one of the reasons I'm able to get so much done is I've just figured out how to get more than 24 hours out of a day at this point. You know, it's yep. what all can I be doing? Most of the time, if I'm in, um, you know, a, a normal Zoom meeting where I'm talking with one of my team members or something, I can multitask relatively easily and stay on track. Um, so I'm typically in chat GPT doing something mm -hmm. to to further, you know, a mission of mine in, in some aspect of, of my life. But I'm I'm constant. I'm creating something while I'm talking to that person. But I'm also probably recording that conversation so that if I happen to have a nugget that I throw out there, it's on video. I can get it, and boom. But my gosh, man, let me tell you something. I'm gonna have to figure something out. I'm waiting on uh, James Jenkins is gonna send me the the setup that he had put together for himself. I gotta get a permanently mounted camera because dealing with cinematic footage on your iPhone is insane. I did that hour boot camp that we did back on December 27th uh, and the, my one hour just on the oh. cinematic portion of it was 125 gigabytes. Yeah. Yeah. And uh. it's, it's impossible. Like right now I keep looking at my phone because I'm trying to send where I recorded um, the new producers call. And I, I did two different recordings 
in our sales meeting today. I'm trying to send it to Dropbox because I've got to get it from my phone over to my computer. And even the lightning cable doesn't no, make that work enough. any faster. <laughs> so I've got to upload it to Dropbox, download it to my computer, edit it in Premiere, export it. Then I have to upload it to Vimeo because I need to get it in a public link format so that when I do, I can um, send it over to Munch. And then, then Munch can go read everything. Yep. Yeah. It's so crazy, man. It, well, beginning of last year, I had the idea of, I want to do a podcast. Hey, it's more, more, it was more ego than anything. And I originally, I was like, okay, if I'm going to do this, I don't have the capacity and I don't have the budget to hire somebody to transcribe my notes. And I found fireflies and somebody showed me otter. I was like, okay. And then I took my podcast episodes, fed it through, took the, the transcript from Fireflies, sent it through Zapier to ChatGPT and said, acting, and just wrote a prompt, experimented with some props and said, acting as, a, uh, actually I said, acting as the producer of Entrepreneurs on Fire podcast, transcribe these notes, or go through these transcription and give me the show notes for me to publish. It made all of those things, but the video, yeah, the video thing, I don't do a good job with video. I, you know, I worked for one of the most prolific video producers in our industry. Um, and Nick, Nick has an amazing setup. Um, he's got like a Sony mirrorless camera going. He's oh, got I've got, his... I've got his setup, man. He sent me the link when I was ready to yep. go down that road. I'm like, you know what? Just tell me what I need. Actually, right over my shoulder over here, I've got the Canon A64 on the roll around mm -hmm. stand. Yep. I've got two Canon A6400s, and I've got the Sony, um, the Sony A7 in the back. Same thing, yeah. mirrorless camera, and, yep. and literally just uh, a piece of paper, like a piece of background paper that's in that gray. I've used the same piece of paper for like going on three years now. I've not even had to take it down because it's a perfect neutral. But where you know where I've adapted is finding other areas in my life where I'm having conversations or could capture things that I really need to get, get down and, and take advantage of being in a position to where I'm not multitasking and I can focus on it, which is kind of where carpool closer came from with my, with my son, yeah. but it goes back to another thing, man. I'm solving multiple problems. Mm -hmm. The first well one is, I'm teaching my son the industry and sales tactics because he's asking me a question that I'm answering for him. Mm -hmm. We're just recording it and sharing it with everybody else. And what my real idea mm -hmm. with that is at some point, I'm going to turn the camera on him and let him answer the questions and let me ask them. And ultimately we're going to use AI. We're going to transcribe every one of those. We're going to turn it into a daily sales reader. So when we have 365 episodes, I'm going to transcribe it. I'm going to go back, edit it. I'm going to add what I need to add to it to complete the thought pattern for things I might not have put in in the original video on the fly. Mm -hmm. But then I'm going to have a resource that any producer can go. And if you just read for five minutes every morning before you start your day, mm -hmm. you're going to have a, a sales question that's likely going to be applicable to you answered in or something motivational that you can go out and act on right away. Yeah, but again, I, I'm driving to work. I could just <laughs> drive to and from work, but I'm not. I'm solving multiple problems simultaneously. Yeah. Russell Brunson, the whole reason, like, I, I don't like his software. I'll be honest. ClickFunnels have never been a big fan of the software. You're, you're not the only person who's told me that. <laughs> but I copy what he says and does because it's smart. One, the first podcast that I got into was his Marketing in the Car podcast. He was doing the same thing. He would literally just turn on. He had, um, the way he described it is he was just by himself, but his 10 minute commute from his house to his office, he would literally just plug in some earbuds, air, just the wired ones, and just talk about a marketing tactic for 10 minutes or the thing they were working on. And then I was watching that and I said, I'm going to experiment with that. So I did an experiment. For 30 days, I, so from the time I went to my car till I got to my office, I literally just recorded a selfie video. And I look, I know I look like an idiot walking through the skywalk of Des Moines, <laughs> but I was literally just talking about the th thing I was working on that day. And I'll be honest, when people say, Nick, how did you, you know, how, how have you moved through your marketing career so fast? It's because I talk about the things I do. People pay attention. People, companies want to work with me. 
because I put out there, they don't have to go search and guess what I do. It's on the social media record for eternity of what I did. And I think agents could be doing the same thing you're doing. Block off five minutes when you get in the office. And if you don't have somebody to ask you a question, just come up with the questions you ask. Or what, I, what I'm working with with Patrick, um, his producers and his CSRs are supposed to be submitting questions they get from their customers and their clients and send to him in a form every day. If they, if you have four people doing that, that's, you know, four, that's four times five, that's 20 questions a week. You're going to get some duplicates, but you just fed yourself a, in a month, hundreds of pieces of content. You can record in five minutes, stick a cell. Like I don't even, my, the videos that I do on uh, Facebook, on, on YouTube, I have a box, a selfie thing and my iPhone 14. I put it vertical for if I want to do short, horizontal, if I want to do a longer form video. I'm a marketer and that's my setup because I don't need anything more. The equipment excuse is the weakest that there is, man. You don't have to have it. If you've the, got a cell phone, the only thing that I tell people, if you absolutely want to improve what you can do with the native functions of your phone, spend less than 20 bucks and get an external mic that plugs mm -hmm. into the power port on your iPhone, which I have one of those and maybe get you a little desk tripod. If you want to mm -hmm. make sure your phone's stabilized and it's in an area that you're getting a good angle. Aside from that, you don't need anything else. And you know, one of the things that I've always told my crew is, and even when I travel and speak about creating content, Anytime somebody calls, you should be listening to what the people are talking to you on the phone about. When you get the same question twice from two different people, write it down, right? That's not an outlier. Like at that no. point, you're, you're going to mean two questions two two people ask you the same thing out of the sampling of your day. That's going to be a trend. And mm -hmm. those are the people that actually decided they wanted to pick up the phone and make the effort to call you to ask the question. The other 99% are just going to Google and typing it in. So you know, the other thing that we do is we use uh, answerthepublic.com. We'll go topically based and look there and do the kind of reverse Google search that they have and create content around that, man. But really the hardest part about content starting, once you start, if you just stay in the habit, you're you're going to you're going to look forward to it honestly every single day, whether it's because you've got a really great topic you want everybody to hear or you just look forward to getting over with it because you know you need to you know you know you need to go have a million other things you get done but you can't do it until you get done with that and that's really the biggest difference for me more than anything else is every single day content is first 100% of the time yep. if i don't make that first it's not going to happen which yep. is why the gym should be first right then i would it's, be in the gym yeah um and I, I for anybody out there that's listening my, I, I put out a, 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 like my average email is 800 to 1500 words. It's a blog post. The whole email is just a blog. Easily post, digestible. Right? Yep. I write it. So it's easily digestible. I write it like I talk. Um, and literally what I do is I have, I have four hours a week dedicated to doing this because it's, it has to be, it can't be AI. It has to be me. Right. I do use AI to come up with outlines and come up with ideas like if, but I have this massive idea board. Anytime I'm talking to an insurance agent and I got fireflies going, I read through it and look for things I haven't talked about before. Or like you said, things people ask me multiple times. I put those into my idea board. I have right now, my idea board has 127 topics in it <laughs> that I have not covered yet. Uh, I, I do that, that. So I put the ideas in. It's about 15 minutes twice a week. I do that. Just go through and put ideas. You in. could literally do. put out an answer every single day during the work week. And that's over six months of content. Yep. So my, but my, my whole content process is four hours. It's two 15 minute blocks of ideation. It's 30 minutes of research. So I'll literally, all I do is I go to Twitter and I search for that topic or that idea. And I see what other insurance, because I follow, that's all I do. I follow insurance agents. I follow like 1,800 insurance agencies that I found <laughs> over the course of the last seven years. Um, and I look for things that they have said. If they've talked about it, cool. I'll expand on their idea. If, the, if I can't find it, well, then I've also got seven, I've got 20 years of sales experience to lean back on and go, okay, this is how I would approach this topic. 
I write for 30 to 45 minutes. I let it stew. That's Monday. Cause my, 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 my newsletter comes out Thursday morning, Monday. I write, I let it, I write it, no edits raw. I let it sit overnight Tuesday afternoon. After I get through my Tuesday meetings, I go and I read it and I read it out loud and I start editing. I let it sit Wednesday's publication day. One more read through that takes me like 15 minutes. Most of the time. Sometimes I'll be like, I'll have a conversation with somebody. I'd be like, ah, uh, we're going to go different. And I'll rewrite the whole damn thing over at like three o'clock in the morning on Tuesday. But yeah. I'm a psychopath. So don't do that. <laughs> um, and that's my process. So about so four hours a week, not even most times. So a lot of times I can just hammer it out. If it's something like a marketing tactic or talking about Google ads or talking about, you know, why you should be asking for referrals more often, that kind of stuff. I can just, I can just hammer out. Four hours a week, I'm putting out long form content every week. And if content, and, and I, I, the reason I do that is content, putting your content out into the universe is more than just SEO and search. It's more, it's also your, it, it teaches your, it wires your brain differently because you're talking about it and it stays in your brain. So when somebody does ask you that question, it's there. All of those things are there. It's teaching yourself. It's teaching other people. It's being helpful. And it's, and in long term, the content will benefit you. I watched when I, Patrick McBride was the very first person I said, Hey, I want to do this thing. And for a, a year, I helped him. I wrote the content. I wrote the video scripts and I watched his trajectory. And then in July, something happened. I don't remember what. So he was, he had this massive trajectory. It was a, it wasn't a hockey stick, but it was a, very gradual, you know, his, his search went up, his clicks went up, his rankings went up on all kinds of content that other large companies are ranking for. And he's beating them locally. July, he stopped. Something happened. And his trajectory fell down a little bit, but then it leveled off and kept going up because it ha he had a year of content. 52 weeks of content produced and out there in the world and everything. And he stopped posting on social media. He stopped producing new content, but it still kept gaining traction. The first month he dropped off, it dropped off a little bit, but where he, the, in August where it came back to, it was above where he started, but he wasn't even doing anything new and he was still above where he started. And then well, we restarted in the fall. And well, it, it goes, it's kind of like the podcast, man. You know, mm -hmm. if you if you start a podcast and you're worried about downloads and all of that stuff from the very beginning, you're going to quit that podcast in mm -hmm. under three months. Mm -hmm. There's no doubt in my mind, if you even make it that long. And I will say Bradley and Scott gave me some pretty sage advice when we started Power Producers. Both of them said, don't even look at your numbers till you get to 50 downloads. Don't even waste your time looking. When you get to 50, then go back and look and you'll see how much you've grown and it'll motivate you to keep going and, mm -hmm. and you'll stay on course. Yep. I didn't listen. I went and looked, you know, and I'm a numbers person, man. I'm driven off of reports and I'm driven off a of building. But when you're building an audience online, I can't just wake up one morning and say, you know what? I want 10,000 followers on LinkedIn. Now I could, and I could probably go hire somebody overseas to manage my LinkedIn and connect with a bunch of people that are meaningless connections because we don't have anything in common. They're not my ideal prospect profile or any of that, but instead I've chosen to be slow and steady wins the race period. Mm -hmm. Like I want people to follow me because they want to follow me, not because I just have software that shoots out, you know, invitations to God knows how many people. I also despise that probably worse than the tacking on the email right after the other one that the, yep. the LinkedIn automations drive me insane. Oh. But, you know, I, I, I think about that stuff, man. And it's like, you need to be thinking about things for what's your, what's your year five year, 10 year footprint. What do you want that to look like? And then reverse engineer that into what are you going to do every single day? I was talking to somebody 
last week. And somehow the conversation about video came up and they said, well, you, yeah, easy for you to say. You have all the equipment, you know, you do it all the time, whatever else. And I said, hold on a second. And I went in and I shared my screen and I went on YouTube and I found an episode of the Risk Management Minute that I recorded almost 20 years ago. And I showed it to him and I said, do you know the difference between me and anybody else that was recording at that time? I never quit. I kept going. So, you know, we had a guy named Brian Will on the podcast a couple years ago, and it was right around the time Sarah Blakely had sold her majority interest in Spanx. And, you know, he was talking about, we, we were talking about everybody that's going to run around and say, oh, she got rich. Look what she did, blah, 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 blah. He said, we call that the 20 year overnight success story. Like, mm -hmm. <laughs> she, this didn't just happen. She's been doing things every single day for 20 flipping years to get to the point where she could have this kind of exit. Same thing holds true with what we do, man. You, you got to start. You can't stop. Not all your content's going to be created equal. Some of it's going to be better than others, but you got to push through and just never quit. And if you do that, even if you consistently put out horribly produced content, but your messaging is right, you're still going to win. Yep. I have a video going on that I put out about the FCC rule change that came out last month, right? Yeah, I saw it. My average video gets like 20 views because I'm talking like the thing people don't understand. I'm talking to what? 65,000 people in our TAM, 65,000 licensed producers and agents, right? That's the estimated TAM in the market, total addressable market. I am okay with most of my videos getting 30 views. I don't really, I, and it's, I'm putting the content out because I need to, I need the video for my blog. I don't even care, honestly, what happens on YouTube. hundred percent, man. That's why I start with video because if I start with video, I can create everything else from that, right? Yep. I can do a five minute video and I know that at my normal cadence of speaking, five minutes on video is going to produce about 500 words for me. Yep. I can get a 500 word blog post from it. I can obviously go back and add to it, but then I can also chop that thing up into 30, 45 seconds, link back to the blog, link back to the full YouTube video, all of those things. But video, video drives the process for me. But like you, I don't really pay attention to what the numbers are. I've got some that are in the tens of thousands and I've got some that are like 20, just like, you know, what you're saying yep. and far more of them in the 20 to 30 range, you know, than anything else. And so I get all of these solicitations from the YouTube experts online telling me, and I'm like, I'm good. I'm, you, it's doing exactly what I want. And they assume that I don't know what I'm talking about. And I'm like, listen, bro, if you want to compare W2s and K1s <laughs> any day of the week, let's put them up. But I, yeah. I'm telling you, you, you have no understanding what the purpose and intent of me having video content on YouTube is. But you're going to give me all the advice in the world on what I need to do to at attract organic viewers there's just not a huge market of organic viewers for middle market commercial sales tactics anywhere online no no and everybody wants to be a mr beast everybody wants to be the next mr beast on youtube i'm like do you understand his payroll is something like 40 or fifty thousand dollars a month for his team same thing with alex ramosi i love the fact that you said you're reading hundred million dollar offers i love that's one of my favorite books. He's also one of my favorite content creators. I knew going into consuming his content, he has a team of people. While the I I tell people make content like Alex Herbozy, make it low quality with like just use Descript. I use Descript now. I, I I signed up for a subscription. I can literally just drop my video into Descript. It does all the fancy captioning and stuff like that. I said low quality high value content will always win always and if you can just copy what hermosi does what gary v like i everybody shits on gary v i absolutely love gary v just copy what he does and you'll be okay like well, you can't it's copy like his airs, content oh airs airs whole made you look video marketing deal was about oh. just having selfie style portrait or landscape videos 
we crushed it, Nick. We, I mean, we were, my agency was legendary inside of made you look because we ran one of the best campaigns anybody ever ran with Nick. And we learned from it because we were not ready for it on the back end. <laughs> and we literally blew it, you know, to be honest with you on a couple of fronts, but we did one for BMW owners. And I spent about a thousand dollars to, um, about a thousand dollars in ad spend on YouTube, but it generated well over a million in premium for us off of one ad. And the the funny part is the reason why we did it was because three of us drove BMWs at the time and we had the cars to put into the commercial. So we're like, let's find something cult like. Well, at mm -hmm. first it was a Harley, but I was the only one who had a Harley. Mm -hmm. Then we were like, well, let's try BMWs. They have car clubs for them too. So we did the BMW thing. And what we found out was decision makers for middle market commercial accounts drive BMWs. So we were driving, we were driving leads for personal auto on BMW. But at the end of the day, I gravitate towards what I know the best. And I ended up writing like an $800,000 ambulance company out of the deal. Uh, the moral of the story is I wouldn't have done any of it if I wouldn't have had my stuff out there to begin with. Yeah, I I have this playbook I've been trying to get an agency to use forever. And it's the same thing. If you're a car guy, if you're a Harley guy, Make content Jeep. about Jeep if you're, is another oh, big one, man. Oh my god, yeah. Broncos. Like I have a Bronco sport. I don't talk about it anymore because it's a baby Bronco. It's not like the big boy Bronco. The, the new ones? Yeah, I gotta yeah. I love it. I love like if I was an insurance agent, I would be the Bronco sport guy. <laughs> <laughs> have you ever like I'm gonna go off track and I'm giving somebody a plug? They're not a they're not a sponsor or a partner or anything, but have you ever checked out um Vanguard Motors? Does their stuff ever show up in your news feed? I think is that like VNI or VIN? No, Vanguard. No, it's, it's, it's called Vanguard Motors. It just probably it's, do. It's, I consume so much. They restore cars. That's what they do. Yeah. But when so, you said you're a Bronco guy, they'll take like the old school full size Broncos oh, from the early '80s, and they're pristine. I just started seeing them. Yeah, so they're and like they sell them for over a hundred thousand dollars. Like they're, they're like, getting these cars, and they're making a huge margin on them. Yeah, they're like a resto mod taking original cars and putting modern tech in them and stuff. No, that's, that's awesome stuff. It's really, really cool. So here's the playbook. What I want insurance agent, an insurance agent, who's a car guy, a Harley guy, a Jeep guy, a Bronco guy, whatever, Ferrari guy, I don't care. Create a bunch of, go to your local cars and coffee. Every major metro, Des Moines has one. And we only we have, have a million them. people. Every city Multiples, has a Multiples, man. Multiples. Go to cars and coffee, find some cool cars, Talk to the owner and say, hey, listen, can I record a video of you talking about your awesome car to put on my blog post? Or do a podcast. Or do, uh, yeah. Be like, do hey, a video listen. podcast. Have a mobile podcast rig, like what yep. we travel to conferences with. Set it up and interview somebody or multiple people each time you go to those things. So if you have a specialty car brand you love, just or just general sports cars or you know high-end luxury cars, whatever, Create a bunch of content, video content, create blog posts about it. Run Pinterest ads to those car people with that content. Pinterest is the fifth largest search engine on the internet. Fifth or sixth, it might've dropped down. Car guys go and look for, so if you create content about a really cool car you found and you run a, a high top of funnel ad about that content to people in your metro or your state, you can get pennies on the dollar clicks. Build your audience, get them in your emails, get them and then eventually get there. You keep producing content, get them in them, retarget them. That you can, just like you said, you spent a thousand dollars on ads and closed a million, millions in revenue or millions in premium. It's the same, like, those playbooks are so easy and it's, you get, and it, the fun part is it's like, I tell people this all the time. You have to put out boring insurance content. You need to, you have to have the foundation stuff. You have to you talk have about to have that. So they know that you are credible for what you're, what you're trying to do. You do. And this is anytime who comes into me, any, anytime an agency comes to me with, for the fractional CMO services, I say our first three months are going to be boring. I have to write. 12 or 16 blog posts about the foundations of insurance, deductibles, loss, you know, loss of use, all these different topics. They have to exist. 
because that way, when you create, we start creating the fun content, your, the stuff you like to talk about, that stuff's all there. People click through, they see around, and it gives you other, so they come in for the Ferrari article. You retarget them with the basic content to stay in front of them over time, or you reuse other pieces of content that you split up. You don't, and the, the thing, you don't have to be Alex Hermosi. You don't have to create 700 pieces of content from one video. You don't have to, to get started. That's all. And it, it, the thing I think that happens is people see Gary V. They see you. They see Michael Overstreet. All these people producing a ton of content. That's their hobby. Michael Overstreet. I, is I enjoy fun. doing it, man. I literally enjoy doing it. I enjoy helping other people. It makes yep. me feel great when I get a voicemail or an email or an, a, a message on LinkedIn saying, hey, man, I heard the thing you put out last week. I tried it. It worked. I closed the deal. That, yep. did, that got me this much. That makes my day every single day. I put out a video last week from a, just me, Patrick and I were just on our weekly call and he hit me with something that I think a lot of people miss is the marketing stuff. The, the marketers focus on the KPIs, right? They focus on the open rates and the traffic and, and ad spend and everything else. What most people don't realize is those guys who are, those people who are putting out content the lurkers are where the money is. Hundred percent. Do you follow? Do you follow Chris Walker from Refine Labs? I absolutely do. His dark social concept blew my mind. Yeah, we had him. You should go. But if you haven't heard the episode, I had him on the podcast. Oh, Chris Walker is like one of my heroes. Yeah, he's he is, he's a really really sharp guy, man. Especially, yep. I mean, and if you think about it, Nick, dark social is where we were twenty five years ago. Like, yeah. you know, just it, talking it, the water. All dark weird. social was when I was a kid was your mom was sitting in the bleachers at your little league game with a bunch of other people, and everybody was talking about what they bought, where, what their experience mm -hmm. was like. There was mm -hmm. no way to monitor it; nobody knew where the 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 custom new customers came from. Mm -hmm. But that's what dark social essentially is on the internet. I think another thing that a lot of people miss and you know, I'd be interested in your thoughts on this as we get close to wrapping up here, but I, I feel like you do have to do what you said. You have to have the boring insurance content. You have to have credibility. It's your occupation. It's you want people to make a buying decision. They're not going to do it because you put up stupid cat videos on YouTube. I mean, you, you do have to be credible yeah. in your profession, but mm -hmm. I don't necessarily know that you always have to have insurance content be what drives people to your domain. And nope. so here's here's what I mean by that. When I did Protege um, two or three years ago, I had a, 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 a group of people on there that were into trucking. Mm -hmm. And so when when we did the show, we would bring the, the producers in that had applied to be on the show and we would run them through a series of challenges. And then at the end of those challenges, we would have eliminated the people that we just felt like needed to be eliminated along the way. And we were typically left with like five people. They would take the mousetrap that they built through the challenges, then go out into the real world, use that to produce. And whoever the top three in production were out of the five made it to the finals. And then they had to do a final presentation that was live streamed. And we had a, a vote, you know, that took place over the course of a week to see who the winner was. Well, we had a group come on, they were heavy in trucking and I went to the agency's website and it, they had all kinds of good stuff. Like, from a content standpoint, very diverse, but they, they had some recipes for things that were appropriate seasonally and other stuff. And I'm like, these people are going to kill it when they get on here. They're going to absolutely crush it. I, I, I see what they're doing. They've got a presence on Pinterest. They've got this, they've got that. And they flopped. They didn't do what I thought they were going to do. Because in my mind, what I was thinking is, if I have an agency that is specializing in trucking and I want to get as many truckers to see my name or get on my domain as, as much as possible, I'm going to do a series of blog posts starting with the top three truck stop cheeseburgers in, Des Mo in, in Iowa yep. or the best fries at a truck stop in the Southeast or the best wings or whatever else. Get really good images. Take that stuff to Pinterest because even if the truckers themselves aren't over there, it may show up in search or their significant other that's at home scrolling through Pinterest sees that and it's like, wow, you should see the burger I saw today. Really? Where was it? Well, here, I'll just send you the link. Boom. Next thing you know, now they're on my domain reading my review. And in the sidebar, I've got start a quote. Are you insured for life insurance? You know, all the other stuff. 
you you have to lead people to the environment you want them to be in but marketing is not closing the sale in that one thing that you put out it's literally getting people into your ecosystem and driving them to a place where they can then self-select and consume the content a good bit of that could be dark social but if you have a good crm which we do hubspot tells me everywhere you're going i have no worries whatsoever if i if it's tied in to our crm i know every time you open an email from me i know Every time you fill out a form, I like I know, by the way, if you're an agent listening to this and you come to Florida Risk Partners and you're doing your sneaking around on my website, you're not fooling anybody. I see every single one of your names. I know what page you're on and how long you've been there. I absolutely, I think HubSpot is one of them. Like it's, it. a lot of agents go and they look at the price. They go, oh, that's crazy. I'm like, yeah, but the tools that you get with it is insane. I, I, I know why I, though, Nick, that's the problem. That's called, that's the scarcity mentality that plagues our industry. Mm -hmm. We have people who look at something like that. And their first question <clears throat> is how much does that cost? My first question is how much is that going to make me? And what's the payback period? Yeah. That's all I care about. I don't no. care what the cash outlay is because an investment is something that should give you a return. Do they bitch when they go out and hire a new account manager for seventy-five dollars to $100,000? Absolutely not, because they know what that account manager's job is. It's because they're not familiar enough with tech. They're not familiar enough with CRMs that they just don't even know that they're, how valuable that is. And that goes back to one of the things I've been saying for years. Insurance agencies run themselves like insurance agencies when in reality we're sales organizations and that's how we should run. Yep. So I... Um, I love what you said about the truck. Like this is this here's the playbook I would do if a trucking com trucking agency came to me. Those opinion articles, post them on Facebook as an ad, especially something like tacos or like truck parts, like Mac versus whatever brand. Or uh, roadside cool. assistance for that matter. I mean, yeah. things that, that somebody's probably got pain around if they've ever yeah. had an issue with it. But the, the funny thing is, if you can create an ad that's not topical and controversial or opinion-based, if you can get people to comment on your ad, it skyrockets the reach, it lowers your CPMs, it increases your ROAS, all these things that you want to get improve. So if you like, yeah, if you're a, if you're an insurance agent in Iowa, go do a review video about Casey's Pizza versus Come and Go Pizza, dude. One of the there's a political campaign that you know I live in Iowa, so we're a first in country and all this garbage. I hate it. I get inundated with direct mail. But during the last presidential campaign, a candidate came to Casey's and said he was having uh, you know, having a slice of breakfast pizza. And it was a piece of paper. I don't know if you've ever been to Iowa or ever had Casey's breakfast pizza. Uh -uh. You co come to Iowa, I'll take you to Casey's. And we'll go to get some breakfast pizza in the morning. It's Dude, I can tell you I'm a massive fan of breakfast pizza, so you're not going to have to. Sausage, eggs, cheese, creamy sauce. It's amazing. But they have a really candy. good one, by the way. If you ever come down to Disney, I'll reciprocate. Over on the boardwalk at Disney, there's an Italian place called La Trattoria, and a lot of people don't realize they're open for breakfast. They mm. have an amazing breakfast pizza there. Okay, we're coming down next year, and I'll take you up on that. But so this candidate was eating pepperoni pizza. All the comments were about how can we trust this guy if he doesn't even know what breakfast pizza is. <laughs> but that kind of stuff gets reach controversial or opinion based topics like do it run with it. It's going to get you in, in crazy engagement at, at, you know, last year we did an ad. It was one of the greatest ads I've ever seen put together and it was nothing but meme videos stitched together. We got like 300,000 views off of a ridiculous ads. We, you know, the, we didn't have throw a lot of ad spend behind it. The reach was in, because of, and all those views were because everybody was commenting how funny the ad was. The video the creative had nothing to do with the post. <laughs> we were just trying to create engagement and get views because the, the, the if you're doing a video view ad, and this is one of those things, if you have a limited budget, I have a ton of tactics that will help you to get started. Run video view ads instead of trying to get lead conversions up front. 
run the video view, do opinion based video, talk about your Harley, talk about your you know cars, go interview a trucker that you insure, a trucking company that you insure. Use the video view as your ad objective. After you're done running the ad, you can use the people who watch three to eight seconds of that video as a retargeting. And if, especially if it's something niche like trucking, the truckers are the ones watching eight seconds of that video. You can then run a sales ad, a conversion ad at those people. Because the thing that really gets marketers right now is retargeting is so bad. Like if, if your main audience, I work in B2B SaaS, I work in B2B, most of my traffic is desktop, right? So I don't have the privacy issues that most businesses do, like an insurance agency does. If, sure. if more than 50% of your traffic is mobile on a mobile device, retargeting is not going to work. It's going to be really expensive. But use that video tactic, and you now have an audience of people who've consumed at least eight seconds of your video. That's not on accident. Eight seconds is, that's, they watched a little bit of it. Yeah, eight eight seconds is pretty high relative to what the stand the, the averages are across all video content consumed yep. online. I'll tell you, man, the the retargeting that we ran on the BMW ad was based on the survey. It was based well, it was one of the retargeting ads we did. Yep. People who started the survey, but they didn't get to the thank you page, so the pixel didn't close the loop. So we could run a custom audience of everybody who started but didn't finish and then didn't hammer them. Page. Yep. Then, then I would go over to Facebook and, and, and my video would be, what are you doing? You said you wanted to save some money and you didn't even answer eight questions, eight flipping questions. How hard was it? And you'd be amazed. At, well, you probably wouldn't, but so <laughs> many people would see that. Number one, most of them would reply just because I freaked them out and they wanted to know how I was able to do that. Yep. But, you know, it's it's crazy. So listen, we're, we're over time. We are far from even scratching the surface. Oh. So here's. Here's what I want to do, man. I'm going to give you the invite now because I'm not going to have time to talk to you when the episode's over because I've got another one I've, I'm I'm late for. But <laughs> okay. I really think that it would be a good idea if you and I did like a a, a shop talk series, uh, you know, because we do the, the episodes that we release on Friday are very tactical. Mm -hmm. They're 15 to 30 minutes only. Mm -hmm. Um I want to do like four to six part series on shop talk. So be thinking about what that looks like. And I want to get that on the books as quick as we can. Absolutely. Because I think, I think it'll benefit you as you're trying to grow your, your company, but um, it's going to benefit the agents too, man. And here's what I know. If you give away freely, you don't ever have to worry I, about revenue ever. I, you know what I, I, I mean? Don't, I don't gate anything. I don't, I give way. everything away. Like what's the point? Yep, I agree. They're going to find it somewhere anyhow. So yeah. I'd rather yep. them get what I feel to be the right messaging and the right information than have them screwing around looking for stuff and end up getting bad stuff. So yep. listen, if if somebody wants to reach out to you before we get these shop talks out, what's the best way, what's best contact information, web domain, any of that? It, uh, Just uh, they can come learn more about you. How do they sign up for your newsletter? NickBerry.co. It's right there. It's top, It's like the only thing above the fold. There's a subscribe button. Subscribe to the email, the newsletter list. I don't pester people. I don't, like, it's just, I want to put the content out there for people. So nickberry.co. Um, on LinkedIn, it's Nicholas Berry, N-I-C-H-O-L-O-S-B-E-R-R-Y. Those are my two main places. I'm on Twitter, but like I use Twitter to run my mouth. So I, I, I don't. <laughs> That's all right. I know a lot of people in the insurance industry who do that. And the later it gets at night and the more they've had to drink, the better the conversations get. Yep, so yep. listen, man, it's, um, we've been, like I said, we've been gone over an hour. I'm going to yep. go ahead and wrap the episode up, but there's definitely going to be more to come from Nick Barry. Really appreciate you taking the time yep. to, uh, to record with us today, man, and look forward to getting this out as quickly as we can, man. Well, I appreciate, care. I appreciate being on. Thanks, David. Absolutely. See ya.